Welcome, new viewer. This is the show where we teach you to speak binary. One, one, zero, 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 one, 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 zero. Are the new viewers gone yet? This episode of Hack.5, Darren makes us more paranoid about U3 technology with the USB hacksaw. The software Jedi from Anapaday.com comes down to show us some code monkey goodness. Paul comes back on this side of the camera to show us some great homebrew voice over IP. And we head up north to meet with our friend Andrew in Toronto with some MIDI and some power gloves. Hmm. All that and a whole lot more on this episode of Hack.5. Okay, so last episode, we talked about a way to use the new U3 technology in these readily available, high-capacity, relatively, USB keys to own somebody's box. Now, using a similar technology, we have come up with the USB hacksaw to back up USB drives that have been inserted into that machine. Darren. Yes. We're talking about the hacksaw. What is this hack, and how does it work? Okay, well, first of all... It's uh, based on a program that was released, uh, I think, mid-September by a French hacking group called uh, USB Dumper, mm -hmm. which basically allows you to back up uh, anything on removable media, you know, invisibly, automatically, and we've taken it a couple steps further. Right. Okay. Now, what tools are we going to use to accomplish this particular hack? Uh, let me just go ahead and insert this on this machine real quick. I can open up the folder and show you. Right. So installation consists of plugging in the hacksawed USB key into any computer, or I'm sorry, I should qualify that, any Windows 2000 or greater computer. Right, and this is where the modified switchblade comes in because it's going to use that same U3 uh, virtual CD, yes. CD partition to install itself. Thank you, max damage. And you could Yay. use Amish's sol solution as well. Yeah, for, for a, a non-U3 yes. USB like, a key like this one that it would just auto-run when you open the So open for that, folder. see last episode. So right. you know, notes, we can and that's all on the wiki. Go right through that. So uh, if we go into the WIP folder on this USB drive and go into CMD, we can find this go.cmd file here. And this is the actual installation procedure. And I've commented that as best as I could. And what mm -hmm. this does is it copies the tools over to um, a hidden system directory. Now, if you're logged in as administrator, it will put it in C colon backslash, or I'm sorry, your system root, which is normally C colon backslash wisdom. So the C colon back, <laughs> words, C colon words backslash, Ethan. yes, C colon backslash windows, backslash, dollar sign NT, uninstall KB, 931337, dollar sign. So it kind of blends in with the rest of the it, uninstallation. Yeah, it looks like all that stuff there. So if somebody were to try and rut through all that and yeah. try and find something that wasn't supposed to be there, they'd have a hard hard time doing so. They know what they're looking for. It looks kind of legit. Okay. Um, if you're logged in under guest, this mm -hmm. works as well. And it can't write to the Windows directory, so it will install it to application data. So that'd be C backslash documents and settings backslash username backslash application data, and that's a system or a hidden folder at least. So Long story short, like for because uh, I know you told me this will auto-run later. Mm -hmm. Like every time they restart this computer, it'll auto-run and put itself back in RAM and now, if you're administrator, that's where the uh, changing the registry goes into because you can do that as administrator. Right. But if you're a guest, it goes into the start menu. Right. So it'll still auto run. Yeah, it goes into the start menu under the startup folder with a blank icon and a blank file name or mm -hmm. shortcut name. So to do that, I guess we can get into the tools. The tool for that is shortcut.exe, and that's right. a really nice little command line program to create shortcuts. Who would have thought? Yeah. Uh, we also use RAR which we may be familiar with as a archiving tool. It's very similar to Zip, and that's what mm -hmm. allows us to, say like somebody plugs in a USB key on this machine that's got 50 megs of documents, it will cut those up into 10 5 megabyte chunks ready to be emailed. Right. We also use to email Blat, and Blat is a command line tool for sending email, very similar to SendMail if you're uh, running the Unix stuff. And we also use S-Tunnel, which is a, a command line program that allows you to create an SSA, I'm sorry, SSL connection to our mail server. In this case, we're using smtp.gmail.com right. because... Readily available. That. Yeah. 
And we're using the modified USB dumper application. Right. Okay. So, so that's the installation. Now, what's this hack going to do? I mean, how's, how's it going to work? And you've got it. You, this machine's been hacked already. Right. As soon as I inst uh, plug in the drive, just a few seconds, it takes care of the rest. Okay. And say, for argument's sake, if somebody wanted to be black hat about this, this was a client computer on a university network mm -hmm. on campus. Right. And you've owned this machine, and you know you've owned it. Right. So you're gone. Your okay. Your USB key so goes away. Take this out. And then some unsuspecting college student, i.e. <laughs> me, comes in. Oh, darn, i got to use this. I, I don't have a printer in my room. I've got to print this out. I'm not going to carry just my paper on here. I'm going to have a lot of stuff on here probably, right? MySpace pictures. Maybe. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, all right. So I'm going to insert this into the machine. And, oh. and we just you know, get the, the normal removal disk. What do you want to do? And that's all there was to it. Right. Okay. Now, now this has been backed up. If we open the folder, we can actually see what's going on here. So I'll go ahead and cd to dollar sign nt, uh, what did I say it was, nt uninstall kb9 If I start this folder, you can see that here's the payload from our uh, USB hacksaw. Mm -hmm. And what it had done was it ran this send.batch file here. Now if we go ahead and edit this, we can see that this is where we configure our options for what uh, email address we're sending it from, what email address we're sending it to, as well as the password to the send from email. Right, the, the account, in this case, we're so using can, a Google account, or right, Gmail account. So that it can use S-Tunnel and Blat to log in and send those files. Right. And it's also removed those files from the system after it backed them up. Okay, so it cleans up after itself as well. Yes. Very nice. So if we head over to our Gmail, all of a sudden, hey, look at this, contents of goody.rar. And if I were to open that up, I would see the same thing that I would see on this drive, and that is some screenshots from the Golden Knight Source Project, which we'll talk about later or earlier, depending on when this goes. So that's how right. that works. Now, I can see how this could possibly be a self-perpetuating hack, maybe, yes. like very worm-ish. It could. It has the potential to do that because, and we've made it easily modifiable. I mean, the sources out there, the, the batch files are easy to open up, and you can take this to the next level, just like many of the community members have done so on the forums. Right. So uh, it would be trivial to add some code so that Wes's USB key that he brought to the you know college campus to print out his term paper when he plugged it in, you could make some code that would send it to this code and make some stuff happen. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And but you could make it so that it would put the same payload on here. Mm -hmm. And then when Wes takes it to another computer, they would tell two friends, and they would They'd tell, tell two, two friends. friends, and so on and so on. Now, the only, my, my only question about that is this is not a U3 right. USB Right, you would key, use Amish's technique. Which is the open folder, and then it would execute. Exactly. So, But there is the potential for that to happen, but we're not going to show okay. you. We don't have any code to do that. Now, assuming somebody has taken a Black Hat approach to using this as a USB backup, mm -hmm. more so, is there any way for home users and like sysadmins like ourselves to prevent this from happening. Sure, yeah. Um, you, right now, my best advice is to follow best practices when it comes to removable media, especially in the corporate environment, and that includes disabling auto run, and we've got mm -hmm. links on our show notes to do that. Um, I think also one of the big things is actually education of users, because many users just don't think that, oh, it's innocent, it's, it's like just, a floppy, yeah, but it's no, just, it's not. Yeah. It can run stuff as soon as you plug it in. So, so in, in that case, if somebody's going to be using your computer at home, oh, use my thumb drive. Yeah, not so Hold much. down shift while you, before, exactly. hold, yeah. Yeah, hit it and hold it. while you insert it, so that way auto runs disabled. Yeah, if you hold down shift while you plug it in, that, that'll take care of it as well. And also, next episode, we will have a um, kind of a rundown. We'll be doing a review of some of these uh, enterprise-level security applications. Mm -hmm. That will take care of removable media. And uh, we're, you know, just getting those in the labs now. So look forward to that review on next episode. All right. Well, thank you, Darren, for increasing my paranoia of thumb drives. Did I mention that it's uh, not susceptible to antivirus? Yeah, you did. Okay. Uh, that's what? Mine. Oh, well, if, if you want, I've got the antidote right here. The antidote? Yes. Yeah, the, the, the hack tool. Mm -hmm. Here we go. We've got the uh, hacksaw. We've got the antidote. And Oh, which one are you going to plug in? Yeah, you look Not like so a tool. Thank you. Anyway, so <laughs> for more information on this hack, obviously visit the uh, wiki at hack5.org slash wiki. That's where you can find the source code. Everything's been commented. Um, so let's kick it back to those uh, ugly guys on set. Yeah. Back to you guys.
All right, so yeah, that's really, really unsettling to know that now you can infect my machine. Right, and you know what? I think we need to make it very clear that we're not encouraging people to go out and do this on university networks or corporate networks. That would be very bad. We're I mean, just trying to let people know that it can be done, it's available, protect yourself. That would be handcuffs bad, you know, getting just pulled in by the man bad. So don't, right. yeah. don't do it. And, you know, you can actually use this tool to back up your own stuff, like we mentioned, mm -hmm. and it's a good backup method. Um, but if you are going to be traveling with your USB keys into random computers, really look into some encryption, specifically what we recommend, which is TrueCrypt, and we will cover that on a later segment and have links and a write-up in the show notes. So don't get too scared. It will be okay. Right. Now, next up, we have... Ali with trivia. What was last month's trivia question? It was, what are the ingredients of Tucks on a Rampage from the Secret Easter Egg on 3.11, which was correctly answered by Brian, who wrote one shot vodka, one shot triple sec, and lime juice. It was the most god awful drink I I've made ever me drink had it. in my life. Yeah. I'm sorry I made you drink it. <laughs> it was Don't the drink the Kool Aid. <laughs> yes, stay away from the Kool Aid. This month's trivia question is Firewire 400, a competing standard for USB uh, high speed, is rated at how many megabits per second? Send your answers to trivia at hack5.org. And next up, we have the software Jedi from anapaday.com. So take it away. If you want to make an impact online, GoDaddy.com has what you need. .com names as low as $1.99. Plus, world-class hosting, fast and easy website builders, and much more. Plus, as a fan of Hack5, enter code HAK2, that's H-A-K and the number 2, when you check out and save an additional $5 off any order of $30 or more. Get your piece of the internet at GoDaddy.com. Well, today we have the pleasure of being joined by somebody that you may know as the Software Jedi. His website, anapaday.com, has been getting a lot of buzz uh, on websites like Dig and all around the world. It's been getting a lot of great attention. And he's here to join us today and share some of his code monkey goodness. So, uh, Dana, hey, thanks for coming down here. And, uh, you know, so anapaday.com, what is that and, and why is that? Well, um, it's a site, it's really a blog I created. Um, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, where every night I code an app, um, any type of app. It's community driven. So it, it started off with me um, kind of just bragging to a friend that I could do this. And uh, it, from there it just led into you know me setting up to actually doing it. And now it's been going strong for about 15 days. Cool, so uh, so, so far, what have you written? I've written... Uh, some really useful apps for, for people in a corporate environment, some joke apps. Um, I have an app that you can make any computer in your network make a moo sound like a cow. Um, I have another app that changes your wallpaper based on Google image uh, keywords, um, some graphical apps, some um, utility applications that you remote into servers and, and things like that. Yeah, I, I particularly like the Moo application because it's got that the beautiful setting where you can tell it to move sometime between sixty seconds and an hour, <laughs> and it's random. And if you put that on, you know, fifteen computers, and, and there's no way to stop it. And there's no which way makes to, it even that's more right, exciting. You, you have to actually <laughs> kill the task locally, yep. don't you? Yeah. Yep. So I'm, I'm sure everybody. That's a feature. Is, not a bug, of course. Not. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Uh, IT department. Why is my computer milling? <laughs> Great. So out of all of the apps you've written so far, what's your favorite? The Google wallpaper. I think that one I, I've run every day since on both, my, well, not my home PC anymore, but my work PC and all the people in my office, a, a lot of them also run that app. And for somebody that's not familiar with the Google wallpaper, what does that do? Um, you want me to show you? Yeah, let's can, go ahead and take I can a look. I can pull it up. Okay, so the Google wallpaper application lives down here in the sys tray. It's a, a GP. Um, don't ask me why it's not a GW. It was late. Um, <laughs> that would make a lot more sense. But what you can do is enter keywords, um, things like volcano, um, Smurfs. Mars, Smurfs. Yeah. Let, let's just do Smurfs. That's one I haven't done. We'll, we'll keep and, this and little checkbox the, here, the safe search filter. We're going to leave that yeah, on. Yeah, for the Smurfs, let's do that. Yes. Because um, I'm sure if you uncheck that, things could get quite interesting. Now, there's only one girl Smurf, though. 
So I'm not sure how interesting it would be. No, that would make it even more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Oh. Uh, don't ask your parents. <laughs> so what it's supposed to be doing right now is changing my wallpaper, but instead we're still staring at my beautiful children. Uh, that's because we're doing the uh, the screen capturing software, so that's probably eating up all of the ah, system. There we as go. Soon as, so, okay, so here we have some people. girls dressed as Smurfs for Halloween. And every every what minute or so it has it has it. a setting here the the change rate um, usually at, at first we set that to one minute because it was so fun but then you start getting repeated images so you find that thirty minutes works better the other thing that works well is using lots of keywords so if I use volcano I can also use volcano lava um, and stuff like that so you just keep mixing up the way the keywords are and then it, it works better it gets more images. Now, since you've started this, you've been um, having an active IRC channel while you develop the code. How has that changed the way that you write your code? Oh, it's great. I, uh, I get live feedback while I'm writing the code, because not only do we have the IRC channel, we also have the, a WebEx, which is going now. We tried a screen broadcaster. It wasn't working right. But um, so, so people can actually watch as I'm typing. I've had people correct the, the typos as I'm going. Yeah, yeah which, I thought it was really, really cool. Neat. I, was, I was there when, <laughs> when you wrote one of the applications, and I'm, you know, in IRC on my right monitor, <laughs> I'm watching your screen in the left monitor, and I'm doing my stuff in the middle, mm -hmm. and I'm like, this is really cool. <laughs> Who would have thought one day, you know, coders would be like rock stars, you know, and people <laughs> would be tuning in to check that out and become a social thing. I, so. I've been getting comments that people are mesmerized. They, they get stuck. Like last night, I, I was coding slow. I wasn't even, you know, doing that much. Yet, the, the whole WebEx is filled. And it's like, why? What are they watching? What are they? Yeah, you know, you know I'm They're actually, just waiting for that next line of code to come out. I'm thinking of doing the same thing when we, uh, when we edit, because so many people have been like, how do you edit the show? I'm like, oh, well, yeah, then yeah. I could just be like, go watch. You and know? do it with the, the chat going on is, is great. Get, and you get that feedback, too. You get that feedback live. Hey, we, we don't like when Darren looks like that. Can you edit that part out? Kind of they thing. don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, so, so, you know, you're getting the constant feedback. You're getting the people correcting your code. You know, I'm sure a lot of your uh, creative ideas comes from the community as well. That's how we start every night at about 8 o'clock. I mix it up a little bit. But at about 8 o'clock, um, I invite people into the room. The chat link appears. If you don't have IRC, you can just go to the page and, and get in and just start soliciting ideas. Tell people, sell me an app, you know. Convince me to write it. Send me screenshots, whatever. And can you show us um, the console app? Cause yeah, I, cause sure. I got to say that this was my suggestion. This <laughs> the app that it I was. joined in, and I was like, oh, this is the coolest thing. You need to code this. And it's really cool. And I love it. So what we do is we press Control tilde. Just like you would in Quake or Unreal Tournament and, and all those the, other games I own you in. And from the top of the screen, we get our, our console window. And most commands work in here. Some things aren't supported. It was written in four hours. But this is also open source. You give out your source code as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And have people been really taking to that and evolving the programs after you're done with them in a day? There's been certain programs that have evolved within minutes of me releasing them. Um, one in particular was uh, the application that I have one that hides everything except the active window. And someone went in and added options to it You know, within five minutes of me putting it out and, and posted a link for everyone. It's really neat. That's really cool. Now, there are a lot of beginner coders in our audience. And you're obviously a veteran coder, so what would you, you know, be your, your advice to them besides documentation? Because we know you document oh, yeah. your code as well, All right? of it is fully documented. Lots of comments, too. Um, <laughs> I, I would say, you know, just write lots of code. You know, that's how we all learn. You know, experiment, play with things. It, it doesn't have to be the next killer app. It can print Hello World when you're starting out. You know, that's just as exciting. <laughs> But, and, and dig into source code. You know, if you want to know how to use a function, there's lots of sites on the net you know, besides Google that you can search for code. Right on. What did you start writing code in at first? GW Basic. GW Basic? On awesome. a PC Junior. Oh, well, did that actually have the, the GW Basic on the ROM? Is it one of those? I'm not sure. Because I believe well, I had a PC XT, and if you booted it without any hard drive or floppy drive, then it would actually go right into Basic. No. I don't think it was no, GW, no though. No ROM. It was, it was just like, definitely floppy drive. Okay. And hard drive, no way. Yeah, <laughs> <No hard laughs> right on. But uh, yeah, it's good stuff. So you've gone from GW Basic to what's your favorite language now? C Sharp. Um, everything except one application that I've done is written in C Sharp. It's what I use at, at, at my day job. So it's what I'm most comfortable with. I've done a lot of Java in the past, a lot of J2EE. So I, I might try to you know do some of that so we get some cross-platform stuff going on. So what's after an app a day for you? I don't know. 
I'd, I'd love to hear from everyone what they what they want to be after app, an app a day. Um, I, I'd love to. I definitely don't want to keep going at an app a day for for any more than another fifteen days. Oh, you should do it for uh, years. See what yeah, happens. Yeah. Um, may, maybe I'll change to an app a decade or or an app a century. That's a good idea. Yeah. But well, actually, th this... there'll be something. I, I'd like to keep this community thing going. It's great. You know. If I can get other people involved to, to help me with this. You've got a really active IRC channel and some really cool people in there, and, and uh, you're obviously growing a great community. So, you know, we definitely encourage that, and we find that same way with our show. So, you know, I want to see that keep going. In fact, this show is coming out on the 5th of October. So, you know, by the time when you see this right now, he's actually still coding. And if you're up at, you know, 8 o'clock at night, Eastern Time, U.S., then uh, head over to your IRC channel. What's, what's the server? It's on irc.freenode.net. Okay. And they can and find you in Pound the Software uh, Jedi? The Software Jedi. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, and they pitch your ideas of whatever application you want to see and, and get involved because you're going to be doing this until, what, October 15th? Yeah, somewhere around there, October 14th or 15th. Now, I've got one more question before we get going because this has been, I asked uh, part of our community what they would like to ask you. Um, so I have to ask, Vi or Emacs? Vi or Emacs? Um, notepad? Visual nope. Studio? <laughs> Notepad 2.exe? <laughs> there, there is no Vi, there is no Emacs. No Vi or Emacs. For me. No, sorry, the software Jedi doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do Vi doesn't, or Emacs. Doesn't do the Pico or the Bash? No, I'm, I'm sorry. Just bashing your head on the keyboard. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, hey, thanks for coming on. You're welcome anytime, and it's, it's awesome. So definitely head over to this man's website, anappaday.com, and you will find a complete list in our show notes at hack5.org. Thanks, Darren. Thank you. Well, next up, we've got Paul to show us some open source voice over IP on a slug. Nice. But before that, let's check in with Allie about the polls. Well, last month's poll was 360, Wii, or the PS3. Which one would you shell out for? And the forum's consensus was Wii for the win, 50%. The other guys came in at 25. How many voters should we have? How many what? How many voters? Enough. Enough <laughs> to get a general idea. Yeah. And you know what? We got it from the horse's mouth in Toronto, didn't we? Yes, we did. We visited with some familiar faces up there. Let's check out that footage with their opinion. Jen, the 360, the Wii, or the PS3? Well, I've been really lucky at E3 this year. I got to play all three of them. And as in terms of the ones I'm going to get first, well, unless I win the lottery, I'm getting a Wii. Love the Wii. Just so much fun. Tennis was awesome. Mario was great. And after a few minutes of batting it around, you don't even think about what you're doing with the controller. It was just that intuitive. Now, is it the price point, or is it the games, or is it what? Uh, the price point helps a lot, definitely. For the cost of a PS3, I can get the Wii in possibly every launch game. So that, that kind of is a factor. I love the 360 now. I'm actually starting to come around to seeing how, how much fun you can have with the, with the Xbox Live Arcade. Of course, got to mention Dead Rising, probably the best zombie game ever done. Way better than any of the Resident Evil series. And uh, Street Fighter 2 Online, it's kind of hard to fight against that. So eventually I'll get a 360, but I think the Wii is, is tops on my list still. And the PS3, what do you think? Way too expensive. I bulked at the 360 price, and the, uh, the PS3 makes a 360 you know, with the hard drive, with live. It makes all of that look cheap. Even if I bought all wireless controllers and the most expensive cables, I still wouldn't touch that price. Right, and how many do you think uh, launch units? Four million or two million or 17? Uh, Probably 17, 16 of them to Japan, so <laughs> we get what we gets left over. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jen. Okay, so here we are at the Fan Expo here in Toronto, Canada, and what better place to ask the poll question than in front of the owner's booth himself, Jeremy from Pure Ownage. So let's go f talk to some of the fans first and see what they think. The poll question is, Xbox 360, PS3, or Wii, what are you willing to shell out for? Man, I'm getting PS3, Metal Gear Solid 4, that's why. That's, that's the sole reason, is Metal Gear Solid? Pretty much, yeah. I could buy a PS3, play Metal Gear Solid, and then smash my PS3, and I think I'd get my money with worth. <laughs> all right. None of them, actually. I'd be going with uh, PC all the way. And you, sir? Amiga. <laughs> <laughs> Old school, man. Maybe a Commodore 64. The PS3. Going for the, the big pack, too, $600. Going all out. Going to throw it all on my credit card. <laughs> I'll have my credit card paid off just to go back in debt for it. <laughs> PlayStation 3 for the Final Fantasy series. Uh, yeah. You're waiting for that re-release of Final Fantasy 7, aren't you? Yeah. I'm one of those hopeful fools. <laughs> but the RPG systems, 
it's it's always been the PlayStation, PlayStation 2, and will be the PlayStation 3. Okay, so here we are with the owner, Jeremy. That's right, that's I own. Yes. You see my balls, I've been rubbing everybody in. Yeah, you've been increasing the value I've seen. Now, we've got a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. PS3, 360, or Wii, what do you want to shell out for? Wii. I mean, I haven't played uh, the Wii or the PS3, so it's kind of unfair, and I played the 360, but... Uh, I mean, in terms of getting me all excited and stuff, uh, the Wii's got me pretty excited. Also because I'm poor, and I don't know if the PS3 is going to be an option. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, so you want to flex the Uber Micro on the Wii then? That's what you want? I'm just like, how is that going to work? You know, it's du double wand? Oh, man. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Appreciate okay. it. Take it easy. You too. All right, so there it is, folks. Straight from the owner himself. Now, let's go back to Allie to find out what this month's poll question is. Well, this month's poll question is, Mario for the NES, which games got your green mushroom? One, two, or three? And you can weigh in at hack5.org slash poll. And we'll be back right after this. Now, many of you may be aware of the noob epidemic plaguing our interweb today. We have noobs crawling all throughout the place. They're in our IRC servers, in our forums, in our game servers. And until now, they've just been an annoyance. But now, that time changes. I, Dr. Schneisenhofer from the Microsoft Noob Owning Project, is here to demonstrate our noob owning appliances to turn tasteless noobs into delectable treats for your enjoyment. Now we have the Noob Kebab 4000. Yes, you see, the Noob Kebab 4000 has an innovative new grill design designed to cook noobs in less time with half the fat because you've got to watch your diet when you're owning noobs. Now, it's also compatible with the RS-232 interface. Just take any garden variety noob, throw on some bacon just like mom used to make, and in just minutes, you have delicious noobs for dinner. We also have the new Bona 3000. Yes, with its dice whip and blend settings, it'll turn any noob into a perfect noob every time. As you can see, just toss it into a glass with uh, maybe some brandy and mwah, magnificent. We also have the Noob Owner Plus. Now, the Noob Owner Plus is a toasting device that takes a simple, tasteless noob and toasts it to perfection. Now, once the noob is toasted, just place on some bread with some seasoning. Mmm, and it's so tasty. I mean, you can't get this anywhere else. I mean, mmm, it's just like mom used to make. In fact, if you order today, we'll even throw in Mom's Noob Recipe Cookbook at no extra charge. So order today, operators are standing by. Now why pay for a service that could be dirt cheap if it weren't run by a bunch of profiteering gluttons? That seems to be the question of the day, and here to answer just that is our very own Paul Tobias out from behind the cameras to talk to us about Asterisk. Paul, what's Asterisk? Asterisk is an open source software PBX um, that can run on lots of different hardware, lots of different platforms, Linux, BSD, Mac, Windows kind of. Um, and it has all the features in a normal PBX plus more. Okay, so you say PBX, but for those that aren't familiar with PBX, what is that? PBX is an office phone system, you know, where like you go up to a phone and you press eight to get an outside line, or you press an like, extension an to dial extension, and You don't have to dial the whole number; it's just all inside your say office building. Yeah, I'm used to that at work. I can call HR, and yeah. and I've got an extension when I call the 800 number and you know dial in through there. And you so. have your own voicemail and all that stuff. And this way, we don't have to go through the traditional telephone providers like um, Verizon or NSA. I can't think of any others. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what kind of hardware is involved in getting a service like this set up for our own home network? The system requirements to run Asterisk are pretty small. Um, you can run. It, I've run it off of laptops. I've run it off of Pentium two, like ten gigabyte hard drives. Oh boy! Um, but here we are running it on this NSLU two, which isn't your normal NSLU two. 
Now I didn't really have uh, much to do with uh, changing it. Darren knows more about that. Right, uh, Paul came to me about a month ago when we were talking about backing up and network attached storage and we were talking about FreeNAS and brought this home and this is a Linksys NSLU2. It's a little box that you plug onto your network. It's got a Cat5 here as well as some uh, USB 2.0 ports and then you plug in a removable hard drive and you've got network attached storage. However, it runs Linux and as such through the GPL, the source code's out there, and many happy hackers have gone ahead and modified it so that you could run your own distribution of Linux on there. I believe you can even put Gentoo on there. We did a very simple install, which is called unslugging this box, which uh, runs with kind of a lightweight Linux distro that allows us to do many, many things because it has a great package management system. And that's the point at which I turned it over to Paul and said, hey, take a look at this package manager. What can we do? All right. Um, since you you unslug that, uh, that's just where Asterisk is going to go. What you really use Asterisk with are a phone, because it's a PBX. What uses Asterisk without any phones connected to it? So what we have are these uh, SIP phones, these Grandstream Budget Tone 200s. They're really nice. They're like 60 bucks, and they come with a lot of features. They even act as sort of a router in some situations. Right, you could actually just get one of these Grandstream phones plug it right into your network and, and you could bypass Asterisk completely and go, you know, and use it as a router even. I mean, these yeah, things yeah. have so many it features. Has port forwarding. We could do an entire segment on these, this piece of hardware alone. Yeah. Um, what are, if we don't want to use this, what other piece of hardware can we use? Oh, well, actually you can go phone list and just run it off of, say, a computer with free software, kind of similar to Skype, but it's more open. You'd use something like a Kiga or uh, Gizmo's uh, SIP phone. Um, there's lots of different SIP phones out there that you can use and I'll give a link to those on the wiki. Right, so for those, that's a soft phone and you would use one of these yeah. and we're probably used to that on Xbox Live and on yeah. Gizmo and Skype and all those other fun voice over IP. Yeah, TeamSpeak, Ventrilo. Um, now we could also use our old analog phones, correct? Yes, yes. Um, you can use a, a media gateway, which will just kind of translate the IP packets into uh, something that your regular old, like, touchtone telephone that you used to have and hooked up to, like, the telephone, the Verizon network or whatever. Okay. So now that we've got our hardware and we've got this box unslug, which just turned it into a Linux box, we can SSH into it. Yeah. How do we get asterisk on this? All right. In order to install asterisk on it, it's pretty easy because... Um, the version of Linux on there comes with a package manager. So to install Asterisk, all you have to do is type IPKG install Asterisk, and there you go. Um, you can also install the uh, Asterisk sounds, just IPKG install Asterisk uh, dash sounds. Okay, so that'll get the bare bones Asterisk system set up on there. But obviously there's a lot more configuration that needs to go on before we can start using it as kind of our own home phones yes. here, right? Exactly. So, so where do we go from here? Um, after that, you need to, since this version of Asterisk is specifically built for the slug, um, it places some of the directories in different locations that the normal Asterisk isn't used to seeing. And it it's kind of hard to configure um, the source code of Asterisk to look for it in different directories. So what you'll do is um, edit a, a comp file called Asterisk and it'll just list where the directories of all its parts are within your Linux system on the slug. Also, we'll need to be able to tell Asterisk what modules to load. Because it's such a, such a restricted machine, it only has 266 megahertz processor and like 32 megabytes of RAM, you'll need to be able to limit the modules it loads so it doesn't get so bogged down and sound terrible and just run slow. Um, you'll do that by editing the modules.conf um, there's a couple ways to do it. The easiest way I found was to auto load everything and then tell specifically which ones not to load. And because it's a less powerful processor and whatnot, we can't load some of the more uh, processor intensive codecs, correct? Yes, um, things like uh, the Speaks codecs, more just higher quality um, codexes tend to be too tough on the machine, so you go with like GSM, A-Law, or U-Law. And that'll allow us to run like four simultaneous phones on this piece of hardware, right? Yeah. 
Great. So, you know, this isn't a good solution if you're looking to do like a call center. No, no, you definitely don't want to go like that for a call but center. But for $80 for this hardware and, you know, $60 for the phones, if you that just you don't need even basic, need to. Yeah, and if you just need a basic setup, that's a perfect solution. Yeah. Okay, so we've got our modules configured, we've got asterisk conf configured. What's next? Next, you'll want to be able to configure asterisk to be able to send out email so it can notify you when you have like a voicemail or something. The package is called ESMTP. Uh, it's just another IPKG ESMTP. Um, after that, you'll edit the uh, ESMTP RC file, and you'll connect. You'll put in the information for your like ESTM. Your SMTP server yeah. from your ISP. So that's kind of similar to SendMail, right? Yes, it, it's designed specifically to use the same kind of like uh, contexts and uh, commands. As sent mail. So, like, if I were to get a voicemail, I would actually get a message from the asterisk system. Yeah, and it can even attach that voicemail with it if you choose to do that. Oh, like as a WAV file? Yeah. Sounds great. So, what's next? All right, next you get into the main part of controlling asterisk, which would be setting up like users, uh, which would be like the phones or your soft phone on your computer, and then also your providers getting connected to them so that you can have an inside, I mean, an outbound line, an inbound line. Okay, so you mentioned providers. What exactly are we looking for in a provider, and what is a provider going to provide us? They give you essentially an authentication string, a registration string, which is which will be like your phone number and then the password you use to authenticate with them and the proxy that you hook up to. So the provider is really kind of a gateway that's going to allow us to bridge into the PSTN. Yeah, that's exactly the, what the they The public do. switch telephone network. And that's kind of like the old school, if you remember, you know, if you've ever had a telephone, <laughs> basically. So we can call people's phone numbers, and we'll get a phone number that they can call us on. Yeah. Okay, so without a provider, we're just kind of limited to the intertubes. Yeah. Ah. So you don't have to... Essentially, it translates your IP address into a phone number for you. Right. That's and other people can call, and you can call from. And we went with Teleex, and it was pretty inexpensive, wasn't it? Yeah, it was uh, five bucks for a line, and then we put what ten dollars down for point like zero one cents a minute. Yeah, it's it's uh it's pretty cheap. It comes out to I think six hundred and some minutes for ten dollars. So I mean, it's a lot less expensive than it would be going through the uh, you know the regular phone companies, I guess. So once we've got it registered on our SIP providers network, and we've got our telephones, which are users created uh, through the SIP conf, what else do we need to do to set up kind of rules so that we can call out and call in and fun stuff like that? All right, that's the main function of the extensions.conf file. Here's where a lot of the fun happens, where you get to pretty much script out how Asterisk is going to treat uh, its users as far as the incoming line from your provider, the outgoing line to your provider, um, where you'd like dial 8 and get your dial tone, you'll dial the number who you ever want to call. And it'll also be your internal context for, say, dialing one from Darren to Wes in the other room or something like that. Okay, so like if I can, if I have my phone in my room, Wes has his phone in his room. And I can... you'll just dial his extension, and his phone will ring. He'll be like, "Go away." <laughs> that's just like when I like instant message him, and he's like, "Why are you typing to me? I live here." Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's cool. So um, globals and variables. What's that? The variables are essentially just easier way of uh, defining who you use. There's a, uh, defining, like, say, your trunks for your provider, and then, like, the users, it's just having one simple name for all to put in instead of, like, say, typing what kind of user they are and then, like, their name and extension. Okay, so it makes it easier when... So you can just say, like, the Wes is this person in this file. And that's all it is. And then when later on you call that variable up, it'll be like, oh, okay, that's what that means. All right, so now what happens when we actually call the Hack5 hotline, that 800 number that we've set up? All right, what will happen is, as you can see here, there, um, the call will come in, and right now it's set up for like a home phone system where it will ring all the phones in the house. And if it doesn't pick up, it'll go to like a general greeting, and you can say press 1 to... You know, leave a voice message for Darren, or two to leave a voice message for Wes. And that's something we're you know going to set up on our 757, our, our home phone. Yeah, line yeah, number. that's going to be like our local extension, oh, well, our local phone number, just for around Williamsburg. Right, and for um, the 800 number, what kind of changes do we have with the extension right. file for that? That extension file looks like this. Um, 
the way it goes down is Asterisk will pick up the phone first and it'll kind of give you the greeting um, of where Desmond says, uh, hey, thanks for calling the hotline. Um, dial my extension or Wes's extension um, and it'll ring to either whatever extension you put in but also you can leave uh, a general voicemail for like the casting crew. Yeah, for everybody here it'll go to the community we, email. And we've put like some, some fun little Easter eggs in there oh, yeah. as well. We've put in uh, one for you to hear like the iguanas have taken our phone system and then plays the theme music for fun. Now, when you say the iguanas have taken over the, the phone system, there seems to be a lot of little Easter eggs here in Asterisk. What's up with that? Yeah, I've definitely going through um, the sounds file uh, in the Asterisk system. You can see lots of things like they've gotten the voicemail girl to say all these ridiculous things. Like uh, my favorite is uh, the extension you're looking for. Um, this is not the extension you're looking for. This is not the extension you were looking for. And there's also one about uh, going out, getting drunk, and gambling. <laughs> Sounds like the, uh, I don't know, what does that mean? Open source developers have a sense of humor? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Cool, so you want to go ahead and give it a try right now? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and call the Hack5 hotline and see what happens. As you can see, it's... <laughs> okay, so if I were to dial an extension, there you go. that phone, and you we're pick, pick it, up. it up, and then say some fun stuff. Ah, uh, you can't get the echo again. Oh, come again. on! Wow, that's really good latency. Normally, if you take two cell phones, put them both on speakerphone, and put them next to each other, and say something, you get a good echo. Oh, I can't get it going on. Yeah, maybe it's not loud enough. Oh, I think. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's right. fun. <laughs> awesome. So, now you've, you've written a great tutorial in the wiki with step-by-step -step on how to get this set up on Asterisk as well as links to external resources to do the, the same kind of thing, right? Yep, exactly. Um, another great resource would be, like, I've linked the uh, O'Reilly book on Asterisk. Um, I've also linked uh, VoIP-info. That's this book right here? Oh, no, no. That's a... Uh, was That's this? another great book by Riley about switching the VoIP. It gets into the more sophisticated parts of Asterisk, where you would say be setting up a call center. Oh, okay, but there's a free one as well. Yeah, there's a free PDF. You can get it like chapter by chapter in like one huge PDF, however you feel like reading PDFs. And it sounds like this system is so expansive and, and has so many things that you can do with it that I could see even like later on being able to do maybe some hacking with Asterisk. Yeah, that's exactly why I wanted to get into this, because it has a built-in... Uh, system called an AGI, Asterisk Gateway Interface, where it's specifically designed to allow Asterisk to use other programs, say like Nmap or something a little more interesting. So you could be going 80 miles an hour and Nmapping somebody at the same yeah. time and get some hacks for flakes, that'd be great. Yeah. So uh, yeah, wow. So now that we've laid a great foundation, I suggest that if you are interested in rolling your own voice over IP network in your house and ditching the old telco, Go ahead and head over to hack5.org slash wiki, take a look at this man's great article, and get your VoIP on. Now, if you guys think this mod is cool, wait until you see what we've got in store for you. We head up to Toronto to talk to our friend Andrew, and he's got kind of a hack with a Nintendo Power Glove. And, and MIDI, and a speaking spell, that's some crazy stuff. So, uh, but before we get into that, let's talk about last month's game server and this month's game server. Allie? Well, some of you might know that last month's game was Battlefield 2. How was that, guys? It was alright. Yeah, you know what, I'm not even going to speak I, my opinion I'm on really the matter. I'm really bad about, I'm really bad at that game. Yeah, I, I suck There's horribly. too many buttons! <laughs> Maybe better luck this month, because this month's game is GoldenEye Source. Yes. You guys may remember. Which I might actually play. <laughs> <laughs> you guys may remember about last uh, mid last year mm -hmm. we talked to one of the developers of the GoldenEye Source project, which is a mod for Half Life Two, and it's kind of like if you remember GoldenEye for the N64, N64. It's been ported, and we've got some exclusive screenshots right now because they are releasing a uh, I can't remember if it's the first beta or, or the like first a release candidate or something like that. But they've got a great version coming out for you 
on the 13th of this month, and these it just looks gorgeous. I mean, yes, it does. I mean, if you take a look at these screenshots right here, I mean, I think they've really harnessed the Half-Life 2 engine. It looks beautiful. I mean, I think they've taken GoldenEye to the next level and then mm -hmm. beyond. I, mean, they, 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 I, think, I think they've actually made it so that GoldenEye looks how it should have when it first came out. Definitely, and I cannot wait to start owning people in this. So we oh. will be playing on the 21st, and, oh, you know what? We've been getting emails about the competition, mm -hmm. you and me, the uh, Unreal Tournament. Yeah. It's going to happen. And you're going down. And I might go down. But mark my words, I'm going to own you. <laughs> no, you're not. For those anyway. of you who want to sign up, it's uh, at hack5.org slash land party. Thank you for saving us from ourselves. We'll be right back after these very important messages. Oh, my God. Payback. Is a yeah. Yeah. Mm, that's really bland. Mm. Oh, I gotta say, this noob is pretty nasty. I should blend this one some more. Yeah, I think this one's done. Mm. Mm. Give me some uh, noob sauce. Come on. Yeah, oh. Oh, that's, that's a bloody noob. Mm. Maybe with some syrup. Mmm, some bacon. Can't go wrong with bacon. Yes. Oh, that's gonna be good. That's gonna be good. Mm. Nubalific. Ha <laughs> 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 This is bad. This is really bad. I could cut. I could just cut this. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I feel like Pikachu with the ketchup. All right, cut. Okay, so we're back in Toronto, Canada, and we've met up with our friend Andrew, who's an electrical engineer, and he's here to show us how to make a speak and spell, a power glove, and MIDI all play nice together. So how's it going, Andrew? How you doing, buddy? How's it going, Les? I'm awesome. awesome. Nice to meet you, glad to hear it. Now, so what's going on here? How are we gonna get all these completely different things to work together? <laughs> With hacking, of course. Well, naturally. <laughs> uh, basically what we have is, uh, is two parts. We have a MIDI converter for the power glove that makes it into uh, basically a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. And then we have a MIDI converter for the speaking <laughs> spell that makes it into a musical instrument too, and they're gonna talk and uh, I'm gonna make some noise anyway. Hopefully it'll be awesome. And hopefully it'll sound like music. So, you know, we're talking about music and we're talking about MIDI. So, mi MIDI was originally made for music, right? Yeah, it's a network standard for synthesizers to communicate with one another. It was invented in the early 80s, and uh, it's pretty simple, which is great because it means it's pretty hackable. And how are we going to adapt MIDI to this archaic technology that is the speak and spell? Well, in the case of the speak and spell, what we've done is uh, we've bought a kit from highlyliquid.com mm -hmm. um, that actually allows us to take MIDI messages and look up information in the ROM of the speak and spell and get it to play word fragments, which actually sounds really cool. Um, yeah, we were playing that with that before, and it's like... <laughs> At any rate, the uh, the kit is a great beginner project, so we'll go through that and hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll be cool enough for some people at home to give it a try as well. Sweet. Yeah, okay. let's go ahead. You want to go ahead and crack it open and sure. talk about the inside? Okay, so we've got the speaking spells finally cracked open, and uh, this is one that we had out. This is an unmodded one, and this is the modified modified one, correct? Yeah. Okay, so... If you just want to give us a quick overview of what's going on in here and what you did differently, you know, wh where's the kit? What what part of this is the kit? And well, this is the kit right here. Um, basically, sticks in this big empty space that <laughs> has been conveniently yeah, left for yeah. MIDI modifications. Um, it's pretty easy to install. You got to solder the board together yourself. Um, that's pretty straightforward. And then there's a wiring diagram on the uh, website of the maker of the kit that we use to connect it to the board. Um, as well, we had to actually cut a hole in the case uh, for the MIDI 
connector. It's pretty easy to do. You can use a Dremel. It's kind of like standard mm -hmm. case modding. Right, uh, yeah. Hobble procedure. out a hole. <laughs> yeah, basically any way you can with whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there's the wiring back there. Just two wires that go to it. And screws in the plastic. Easy enough. And you said the wiring diagram is really straightforward, so it tells you exactly where you need to make your connections and everything else, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really easy to follow and uh, pretty much impossible to screw up. <laughs> Anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> but at least with these boards here, they have you know, like nice solder points and everything, it looks like, so if somebody it's, wanted it's to do this. It's straightforward, yeah. Now, sure. now, granted, it is precision solder work, so I'd imagine if somebody's not, you know... Might not want to make it your first project ever. Right. But uh, it's... I don't mean to deter anyone either. It's pretty straightforward. And just a little bit of practice with a soldering iron beforehand, I think they'd be able to get this, no problem. And, I mean, so, I mean, is there any kind of, like, well, what's, what's so cool and unusual about these speaking spells that just make them available for this kind of mod MIDI modification? Well, they were really advanced for their time. The, uh, the speaking spell came out in 1978, which is mind-blowing if you think about the fact that it basically has... A computer inside. Mm -hmm. um, what we're actually doing with the kit is interfacing to the 4-bit data bus of the microcontroller that's inside the speak and spell and we're basically uh, putting some information on there that it's not expecting to see. We're forcing our own kind of... Uh, <laughs> so we're sending our MIDI to its hardware we're just putting and it, we're making some stuff happen. We're just putting it right in and making stuff happen. Yeah, that's, nice. That's... Uh, Awesome. Kind of brute force, but um, it works. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe if um, maybe I'll just show you a couple features of the board. There's actually a couple different uh, there's a couple different modes or ways that you can install this kit. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually three. The first one uh, emulates the keypad. So basically, when you send MIDI messages, it pushes an equivalent key on the keypad, which okay. will let you have the full speak and spell functionality under MIDI control. Uh, the second two modes are a little more interesting to us um, because they let you make cool noise, which is, uh, <laughs> which is what it's all about for me anyway. Um, there's ROM mode A and ROM mode B, and basically in the ROM modes, the MIDI messages will look up uh, in a table a word fragment and play it uh, through the speak and spells output. Uh, in the second ROM mode, a sequence of notes will look up an entire word out of the table in the speak and spell and play it at the output. So you can either um, have control over, you can have access to any mm -hmm. word that's in the speak and spells lexicon, or you can, uh, you can make any word fragment noise. And it has millions of them, <laughs> seemingly. It has uh, endless banks of these fragments of words mm -hmm. that you can play out. So you can make really cool noise, really cool beats, really cool kind of mm -hmm. garbulation awesome. of sound. Yeah, when, when you're doing like very unique music that you uh, take part in, you help with that, that's like, that's the epitome, that's what you're looking for, something that, that nobody else has, unless they have a speaking spell with a MIDI chip. Well, that's kind <laughs> of, uh, that's kind of the point of the kit. Right. People, people who are interested in getting that sound can get the kit and they can have something uh, different and unusual. That's awesome. Um, thank you for showing us this. Now, uh, next up, I think we should go to the power glove. You know, because that was like a, that's like a homebrew. Like, there's no kit involved in that one. You did that. Yeah, so. that's, uh, that's a step up from here. Let's take a look at it. All right. Okay, so now what we have laid out in front of us is the power glove, but it's not so much the glove itself that you worked on as it is this little plastic box doohickey thing in here. Basically what this box is, is uh, it's an interface that you plug the power glove into, the old school Nintendo power glove. There's and, the Nintendo uh, port right there. Yep, yeah, and it converts uh, position information from the glove to MIDI and sends it um, to other instruments, mm -hmm. and in our case, also the speak and spell. Nice. Now, okay, you've got like a thousand different ports on here, so I was just wondering, like, obviously this is Nintendo. This is obviously MIDI out. Now, we've got this little thing here, and this here, and that there. What are they? <laughs> <laughs> well, this box is like uh, pretty hacked up. Um, it used to be a... Uh, oh, I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be an actual like turbo add-on box for uh, the old NES that I had when I was a kid. Anyway, um, 
the actual processor inside here is a PIC microcontroller, which yes. is pretty common. You guys might have used it in other projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, in addition to the MIDI and the Nintendo, there's a programming port that lets me update the code. Um, this right here. Running in the, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's running in the microcontroller. Uh, there's a power port, and there's yeah. uh, in my case, I actually also have a serial port on here um, that I used when I was debugging and making sure that I was getting my Power Glove messages okay. All right. Uh, this wasn't originally, like you said, designed for... No, no. This circuit is pretty hacked up, too. This is actually a completely different uh, PIC circuit that I'd used for a different project, and I just sort of... Uh, I put the whole circuit board from the other project inside this box and wired everything to it, so it looks like a... It looks like a real mess, but I will. Uh, I'll get a schematic for you guys for your website, so, so you it'll can, make a uh, little bit more sense. Be clearer for everybody. Okay, that's cool because you've got like the serial port to nowhere, nowhere right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of hanging out. Okay, so this translates data. Now, what what's generating the data from the Power Glove? How does that work? The Power Glove actually generates the data. Um, <laughs> The Power Glove is in two parts. There's uh, the glove itself, and there's a mm -hmm. sensor array. Okay. And the way the glove works is it measures the position of the glove itself relative to the sensor array, which is ultrasonic. So it just does these distance measurements. Um, there's basically a computer in the glove, triangulates where it is from the distance measurements, and puts together this uh, packet called a high-res mode packet. Um, the glove can output a lot of different kinds of data, but we're interested in the high-res 3D position data. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically what the interface does is it finds um, the X, Y, and Z position of the glove in that high-res packet and converts that, in the case of our demo today, just into MIDI notes, but it can convert it into any kind of data that can be sent across the MIDI cable. So we could control synthesizers, we could uh, control performance parameters, we can control mm -hmm. lighting with it, and we can do anything performance that, art installations. Nice. So anything that you could ever do on a MIDI network, you can do with the glove? You can have it, well, in our case, we can program the, the uh, microcontroller in the interface to do whatever we want yeah. with the information. Okay, so you've shown us how the Power Glove works and how we get MIDI from that, and how we get MIDI from the Speak and Spell. But at this point, can you show us how everything works when it goes, comes together and makes a big happy MIDI circle? Sure, we'll take a look at that now. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so now we've got everything hooked together, and right now what you're looking at in his lap, if you're looking at his lap, is a MIDI instrument. This is actually a MIDI musical instrument right here, and this has been plugged into the speak and spell and ran through the sound system in here. So if we were to hit a key, say that one we are now hearing the speak and spell like bits and pieces from the rom playing through the stereo so there you like this is basically the first half of our uh glove to mm -hmm. speak and spell crossover project this is the first half of it here this is getting the speak and spell to actually uh make some noise from some MIDI data. Yeah, to actually interface with the MIDI and for that whole, that side of the plane to come together. And I love it when a plane comes together. I mean, like, this is really exciting, though. We've been sitting here playing with it, and it's so much fun. <laughs> you know? My uh, internal four-year-old is pretty ecstatic with this whole project. <laughs> it's like a giant toy. It is a big toy. Giant 80s, like, throwback toy. Which has been melded together with modern-day equipment. <laughs> But that's just so much fun. So should we take a look at the glove part? Yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that. And So since we've got a musical device making funky sounds, now we're going to take an oddball device and actually play back musical notes? Yep. All right, let's go hook that thing up, and then we'll have one big MIDI happy plan come together, and it will be so nice. Okay, so now if we look on your hand, that is a power glove. Is it not? It is so. Okay, and that's been plugged into your little MIDI hackaday device. Yep. There it is, right there. And that's been ran through the synthesizer over here and through the computer and everything else that's MIDI-ified. And we can now control musical notes with this, correct? So how's, it, how's this working here? What are we looking at? Like, Basically, we got uh, 
This is the sensor array from the power glove. Okay. So uh, what happens is the, um, the sensor array and the glove work together to determine the glove's position in 3D. Just uh, in the case of this demo, we're only, um, we're only measuring in the x-axis, which means left to right in this case. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is going to be making a musical note, the pitch of which is determined by the by left to right your, position of yeah, the glove yeah, in, front of the, in front of the sensor array. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a listen. So right now we're hearing a constant note. So there's the glove kind of coming into the field and... Mm -hmm. uh, and you're actually, you're bringing it all the way down the ladder. Yep. Has a pretty cool sound to it, huh? It does, it actually has a really cool sound. It kind of like, it's like the whole like demonic fairy, like 1950s organ music of I am the death <laughs> dealer. <laughs> of doom. Yeah. Now, you are only, we're only, you know, using the x-axis to modify the sound. Now, can we take like the y-axis or Z, as you say in Canada, and change different <laughs> things? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the interface actually measures all of those parameters, including uh, finger parameter and roll of the glove. Um, okay. So you could theoretically map those uh, controls to anything you wanted in the MIDI data stream. You could send. You could have one synthesizer being controlled by the x-axis. Something else vertically. You could make. Uh, volume expression control, any kind of performance parameter that you want to send over the mm -hmm. MIDI link, you can do. Nice. And now we're using the high-res version right now, yep. like you said. So this is all. This is taking three-dimensional movement plus roll of your hand and yep. actual making a fist. So you could sit here and like actually start boxing and do something completely ridiculous if that had been all mapped ahead of time. That'd be kind of complicated, but, but maybe, maybe theoretically theory. possible. It would certainly sound cool anyway. Yeah, you know, you can like sit there and like punch a drum. Yep. You know, so we know that makes music. We know the speak and spell makes sound. But can we make the power glove make the speak and spell make sound? Let's do it, man. Sweet. All right, so we've got everything hooked up. I'm actually wearing the glove this time. Hi. And uh, the glove's hooked to the speak and spell. Speak and spell's hooked to the stereo system. So once... Uh, Andrew turns it on, you're just going to hear like this huge, loud speaking spell racket, right? Yep, and you're going to be uh, changing the racket a little bit as you move the glove. Uh, okay, so I'm going to like have to rock the glove out like, like the Wiz did or something like that. Be like, <laughs> if you can rock it out that much, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's, let's go. Okay, I'm going to plug in the MIDI and you should be ready to roll. And there it is. Now, as I move my hand back and forth. Basically, this is the same demo as we were running with the uh, stringed instrument earlier. It's just a note repeated over and over again. And you're changing the pitch of the note as you move the glove around. But so if in you this hold case, it. We're not actually changing the pitch, we're running through the ROM. Exactly, exactly. So, so if I can hold my hand really still. You should be playing the same uh, sound fragment over and over again. And then as you move it around, you can garbulate it as you look up uh, some other yeah. sound fragments. So I can sit here and just be like... Wow, that's actually pretty awesome. <laughs> the turntable, uh, robot, death noise, interpretive dance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like scratch with that, but I'm not actually scratching, so it's just like random, random, random sound effect. That is freaking cool. And then since it's all MIDI, you can interface it with any other MIDI device or anything yeah. like that. And do what you want to do, assuming you had programmed your yeah, program so the interface correctly. We can do uh, to take whatever. all the functionality of the glove. Let's go ahead and turn that off. So, if people want to find any more about you, where they where can they go? Well, I have a website, uh, barrowdynamics.com. You can uh, find that in the show notes. Okay. Um, the Speak and Spell MIDI kit is made by HighlyLiquid.com, and I suggest everyone goes to check that out. It's a pretty awesome site. They have some other uh, sound hacks on there as well. Um, and yeah, get a speak and spell, get the kit, hook it up, mess around, have some fun. We had actually a whole lot of fun making it and uh, trying it out, so Sweet. you guys should check it out. Okay, we definitely will, definitely will. Thank you so much. I'm going to shake you with the power belt. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then go back to playing with MIDI. So, let's find out what's next. You gotta, you gotta like spin it up. <laughs> what are you doing tonight, man? <laughs> what? 
<laughs> Those are some fine dancing skills. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a whiteboard. Okay, that just about wraps everything up. Uh, we've got a few more things to cover, one including DreamHost is our fantastic web host, and if you would like to get services from them, use coupon code HAK5. They have one-click installs for a wide variety of things, WordPress, MySQL, uh, PHPBB, all sorts of fun yeah, stuff. Yeah, multiple And if you use the HAK5 coupon code, you get $25 off. It's excellent hosting. I've been with them for over a year, and I've mm -hmm. got nothing but great things to say about them. Um, also, the names at the bottom of the screen you're seeing right now. Yes, they are part of the team that's been working on the Hack 5 Rainbow Table. It's 120, yeah. 130 gigs? About 120 gigabytes, and it's supposed to cover the whole, the complete set, mm -hmm. and 99% effective, and this, it's just awesome. I mean, people are really donating a lot of CPU time and a lot of bandwidth to make this thing happen, and once it's complete, we'll be able to have a huge Rainbow Table, which we've talked about in the past, go reference other episodes for mm -hmm. that. Uh, where you can, you know, crack passwords and other fun stuff like that. So that's a really fun thing to donate your CPU time to. There's also been another group that's been dedicating a lot of CPU time to for Folding at Home. It's Hack 5 team for Folding at Home. And I know there's uh, a couple of guys out there that have been, like, built full systems just for Folding at Home. An evil Hack 5 cluster mm. for goodness. Where's the evil part coming in? I don't know. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you so much, guys. That's mad props to you. That's a really, really awesome, a really worthwhile project. And if you haven't checked out the wiki uh, recently, go ahead and take a look because it's really expanded. We've got about 200 articles on there right now. You can find development of the switchblade, the hacksaw. You can find out about uh, some other hacks that people have mm -hmm. done. Uh, if you've got an, a Memorex U3 drive and you've been wondering how to do that as well, Instead of uh, the sand disk type, you can find that out. We've got uh, Moonless, got an AV killer. We've got all sorts of fun stuff. So nice. head over to hackpod.org. And there's also the goodies page. It has a bunch of uh, desktops, both for your computer. There's a couple of smartphone ones. Uh, Testmed will be coming out with a new screensaver eventually, sometime in the near future. And we've got um, the music. Everybody's like, hey, you know, where can I get a copy of your theme song? Head over to the wiki, go to the goodies page, and get all your Hack5 digital swag on. Nice. Um, as always, we're always open to feedback. You can send that to feedback at hack5.org. There's the Hack5 hotline, or you can email any of us. I'm Darren at hack5.org. Wes at hack5.org. Allie at hack5.org. <laughs> and Paul behind the camera at hack5.org. So I guess until uh, next time, this is Darren and Wes reminding you. Oh my god, ponies! Oh my god, ponies! And trust, trust your techno lust. lust. Oh, you got my head. <laughs> That's what I get in certain scenarios. That's right. Own. Paul comes back on this side of the camera to show us some cool VoIP settings. 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 They're like I'm preferences. A, I'm an idiot. I got no. I got this. I got this. I got. I got. I, I got, got it. it. I got it. What? Make me hit you. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Take a swing. Very very top. Oh. Not starting from up here. We're gonna. Ah! Get... <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> like like he's. Plus the software Jedi from anapaday.com comes down to two to para so so rompa para che para baba no more. I gotta learn that language. Excuse me, I have to get a straight face. That's cool, no. I'm used to waiting for noobs. Yeah. Boom headshot! <laughs> <laughs> Did not. Did not. Did not. You see how serious we actually take ourselves? Yeah. Ah! Right. <laughs> Freaking laser beam! <laughs> I call it the Alan Parsons project. In Soviet Russia, the trivia asks, asks you. You can overdub it with uh, random weird shit. That would be <laughs> like MST3K. You say my mother is dog? I kill you. <laughs> we'll be back right after this. Rather than starting from the top, let's start from here. Over, Over the, the top. top.
Ready for your full body cavity search? <laughs> Feel like increasing the value of my glove? <laughs>